I am appreciative of all of you who are here this morning. Uh, thank you for being here. We've got a lot to cover. So we're starting out. Now, let me tell you, as people are coming in, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of extra things real quick before we get too far down the road. Uh, if you've not been with us, we're looking at the issues of a biblical view of science and whether or not that conflicts with the idea of faith. Is faith something where we just uh, blindly close our eyes and jump into an abyss? Or is it something that's very reasonable? Is it something that takes into account science? I'll go a step further and say faith is something that instructs us to pursue science, gives a reason for us pursuing science, and a purpose for pursuing science, and infuses science with morality. Somebody sent me an email this week about some, some cloning issues and some recombinant DNA where you insert uh, certain DNA links into a DNA chain to rectify or to modify uh, difficulties within the DNA, the DNA. This is a hotbed area. It is an area where science is asking questions, how do we do it? Why do we do it this way? And it's one where science can't come up with those answers, short of just some nihilistic, hey, it is what it is, and let's just get on down the road. And once you cross that line, that's where science can become counterproductive and destructive as opposed to science being a useful tool at achieving the ends God wants to achieve. So I'm excited about that. I'm working on those lessons. I continue to work. I do, if you do not get the emailed copy of the lessons and you want them, let me know. I continue to email these lessons out not only to a host of theologians, but I email these out to a host of scientists as well because we always want to make sure that whatever we're saying and whatever we're doing is as accurate as it can be. And so I want you to be able to look at these lessons, but you'll see that I footnote things, you'll see that I reference things. It's for that purpose. So within the framework of that, let's move forward and let's talk about it. Today, we're going to be addressing it slightly different than the, some of y'all are like, hurry up and get to the clone. Someone said, I scream cloned. And I said, no, that's Baskin Robbins. This is, I scream clones. I scream cones. That joke, I'll get that working by the time we get to the class on cloning and, and, and uh, recombinant DNA and things of that nature, but CRISPR genes and what, what have you. But, but for today, I want to begin what's going to come in two parts. I want to really look closely at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 because of concerns and issues that some people have, rightfully considering the interplay of creation and evolution. And so because of that, I want us to delve into it. Now, we've got a problem. Actually, we've got a host of problems. Problem number one. I'm going to have difficulty doing this in one class, so I'm going to have to divide it into two. I've got a logical place, I think, to divide it, but we've still got a lot to cover. Difficulty number two is, next Sunday, I won't be here. Scott Reiling is teaching for me. I think the Sunday after that is our class lunch, lunch breakfast, brunch, is it or is it not? No, it's not. So good, we'll get it the class after that. But if that is our class brunch, the class after that, then we'll get it after that. All to say, sorry. But because of this and because of the way our class rotates, we wind up having, okay, I'm just, I've got a little problem here. My computer's being kind of funky. Yours is not. So yours is working, but mine is now going to be happier. I want to go back and I want to make sure that we're on the same page, but I can't review for long because I'm going to take the 40-minute last class and condense it down into a three-minute review. Are you ready? Okay. There are different ways to see science and faith. One would put them in different camps and say, science is science, faith is faith, the two have nothing to do with each other. If you want to live by science, here is science. If you don't want to or you want to embrace faith, that's fine, but science can't prove faith. Faith can't prove science. They belong in different camps. I've used this slide for three weeks now. 
I think y'all have got that down. That is not the biblical position. That is a position that's been foisted upon people by folks from two different camps. One camp are people who are believers and yet say it. And the other camp are people who are not believers and say it. It's an error regardless of who's saying it. It is not biblical to say that. Biblical teaching is not that faith and science are just their own separate seats on a bus that don't meet. They're, they're not even, okay, well, there's a, some little bit of overlap. It's a Venn diagram. No. The biblical view is one that says science is a part of this world that God made. And we can embrace it. No, not just embrace it. We have been told to pursue it by God. Because it is our tool that we can use for good purposes. It can be misused. I can take a shovel and use a shovel to dig a hole. I can also take a shovel and whack Richard over the head with it. I can use it for good. I can use it for evil. Science is a tool that God has given us because the world in the shape that it's in is one where it's been marred by sin. It's got curses that God gave as a result of sin. Women, pain and childbirth, just one of many. There are all sorts of problems with this world. And science is a tool that God's given us to combat this fallen world and all of its evil. God is at work in this world to try and bring good from evil. And we should be too. What is your purpose in life today? Dale Hearn, it's your birthday. We don't single people out for that, so I'm not going to single you out. But Dale Hearn's birthday is today. So Dale Hearn's got to make a decision. What am I going to do today? What am I going to do this week? What am I going to do this year? Oh, by the way, Dale, Carrie did not want me to tell you this, but she said, anything you want, sky's the limit, whole week. And I'm sorry, Carrie, I know you didn't want me to tell him that. You were going to surprise him later, but <laughs> blank check. Anyway, Dale's got to make a decision. But just because it's his birthday doesn't mean he's the only one. We all make a decision. What are you going to do today? Today, you will have an opportunity to find something that has been marred, that's been tarnished, that's been damaged by sin in this world. It may be someone's heart, physically or emotionally heart. Sherry Stanford, where are you? Over there. Stand up. Do you all know her? She sings. Sing something. Roll out. Okay. She's on praise team. She sings in there. Pediatrician. She has a chance to take children and make their lives better. She does that by the grace of God, but she's doing God's work when she does it. All of us today, I don't care if you're a doctor, I don't care if you are a retired uh, lawn cutter, you have a chance today to do something good in the name of God. To take evil and make it a little less smelly and a little bit sweeter. And that's what science is one of our tools to do that. And so the biblical view of science is when you have a problem, when you're hanging on to a cliff's edge, science is a tool to help get you off the edge of the cliff and move you to safety. If you've got strep throat... And your child has strep throat. You take your child to see Dr. Sherry, and Dr. Sherry will give, I don't know what you give today, amoxicillin or something like that. That bubble gummy stuff is what they used to give. But you want to arrest that because unarrested strep throat will lead later, can lead to rheumatic heart disease. And can do bad things to the body. And so you want to try and take science, you want to try and do that. And sometimes science is going to win. Amoxicillin works great on the streptococcus, whatever it's called. But there are times where science doesn't win. 
We've still got diseases we don't know how to treat. We pray for divine intervention. If the divine intervention will work, great, but because the science isn't there. But please understand the science is not a failure of divine intervention. If we paint science as something outside the scope of faith, then y'all come on in. There are seats, and if not, several people will let you sit in their lap. Choose someone with a donut. There's seats all in here. There's seats over here. There's seats, uh, uh, good seats over here. We do not want anyone to miss a chance to talk about this with us. This is important stuff. Sometimes science can't do things, but just because God will divinely intervene and cause Mary, who never knew a man, to have a child, doesn't mean it wasn't God who took Sarah, who did know a man, and have a child. All children are a gift of the Lord. God is active. God made science. Now, I asked the question last week, can we just ignore science? No, we can't. We should never ignore science. We need to embrace science. I gave you five reasons. I only want to bring up reason number one today. Embracing science will enhance our ability to read Scripture properly. This was the slide I used. If you see Scripture and science and they seem to differ, keep digging. There was a time where people thought the earth was flat. And some people base that upon Scripture. They base that on passages like Psalm 74, 17. You fix the boundaries of the earth. Psalm 72, 8, the ends of the earth. Well, we know that those are just poetic passages. And we've learned to read the Bible better because of science. We've learned that the earth doesn't revolve, I mean the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. Even though the Psalms talk about the rising of the sun to the setting. Or talk about the earth is on its foundations and won't be moved. Or Ecclesiastes talks about how the sun rises, the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. None of us have this picture of the world. Because we understand and we read the Bible better and we understand the psalmist... In 600, 700, 800 B.C., 900 B.C., was not writing a scientific treatise for us to read after we finally circumnavigate the globe and we figure after Copernicus and Galileo and and others that this is a solar system where the sun's in the middle. And so when Galileo figures that out and says Copernicus is right, While he got in trouble, we know better. And it's not, oh gee, you've just started changing the way you read the Bible to fit with science. No, the Bible was to be read that way from the beginning. Go back and read Augustine. Augustine writes in the 4th century on the book of Genesis. He writes a commentary on it. Augustine doesn't write a commentary like you look he's and you know so he writes a commentary on Genesis by the way I brought a commentary on Genesis to give away to somebody preferably somebody no I brought you this Miss Carolyn this one is yours I'm giving Miss Carolyn the book in the beginning we misunderstood because she disagrees with me on what I'm going to be teaching Christopher, would you give this to Christopher, please, Mark? Thank you. Good catch. All right. I've still got it in the beginning. We misunderstood. I'll give it to somebody. Here's the deal. Scripture was always intended to be read the way that we're reading it. You go back to Augustine. Augustine's going to tell you, close your ears on this, Miss Carolyn. Close your ears. That it wasn't a literal six 24-hour days of creation. And that's not something someone came up with to try and read the Bible to fit with science. Augustine's writing over a thousand years before the scientific revolution. And do you know what he calls his commentary? A literal commentary on Genesis. The literal reading of Genesis has historically not been 24-hour days. 
Now, I'm not saying that God couldn't have done it in 24 hours. And if you want to believe that, God bless you. You may be right. I may be wrong. God may be laughing at me now. But I don't think that that's the right way to read the Bible, and I'm going to explain to you why. Because what we're going to talk about today is creation or evolution. Now hear me here. Everybody almost is a creationist. It's just a question of where. Does matter come from Zippo nothing? We got to get the matter to start with. The question is, how does God create? We're going to discuss that in more detail next class. I'm sorry I don't have time to get to it today. Today I want to start out with the two major concerns that most people have with this. Major cons By the way, see the one on the left? That's one, right? See the one on the right? Yeah, when the Roman went into the bar, he said, I'll have five beers, please. <laughs> you know, it's a Roman numeral five. Okay, that is not five. That should be two. There are two concerns. Concern number one is the integrity of Scripture. We want to make sure that we're reading the Bible right. I believe that this is God's Word. I believe that God in its original form as it was originally given, God gave it exactly to communicate inerrantly what he wanted to communicate if it's read and understood properly. I believe that. Upon that, I take my stand. But what does that mean? And what does it mean when we discuss these issues? That I want to address. Second, some people discuss whether or not there's even a need for God. And I don't, I don't fathom that. I don't fathom that. Uh, Sherry, I assume you had to take science classes before you got to med school? Okay. You're here because there's a God. Janet Seifert, my PhD at Rice, is there a God? I, 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 look, I, I've started listing the scientists who are top-notch in their fields. I interact with these people all the time. I'll give you a list as long as my arm if you've got any doubts. And you'll find I've got a list of scientists who believe there is a God and believe fervently there is. Simon Conway Morris is one of the top evolutionists in the world. He's, I think, the head of paleoevolution at Cambridge. David Fleming and I have sat in his home for tea. And he will tell you, as, as one of the world's leading evolutionists, I think he's the second most cited evolutionist, did his work on the Burgess Shale, one of the key pieces. He will tell you, if you want to sit and talk to him, he believes in the virgin birth of Jesus, the physical death, physical resurrection, and the second coming, and that Jesus will come of Jesus physically, and that Jesus will come again at the end of the age. We, we need to understand this, the Bible. Then we can make our decisions on science based on the best science we've got. But I am absolutely convinced, regardless of how you come out on the science, the Bible is fine. There's not an issue with the integrity of Scripture on this point. And the need for God arises not simply because, well, there must have been someone who breathed life into man. <sighs> Set that aside for a moment. Set aside creation and evolution for a moment. There's a need for God regardless. Paul says it in Romans 1. He says, whether you're embracing Scripture or not, the evidence of God is all around us and all within us. All right, so how are we going to get through this today? First of all, Brent, Brent Johnson. He may be teaching. I just want to say thank you. He moved everything fast so I could get him more time to teach. And thank you all for listening. Here's where we want to start. We want to start with Scripture want to start in the beginning. If we're going to understand this class, we need to read what the text says. So y'all read it with me. Barishit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim va'et ha-eretz. Oh. Plan B. Let's do it in English. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, that begins the Bible, and that begins Genesis chapter 1, and that begins the story of creation that's contained in Genesis 1-1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And in that, if we read it all the way through, we would see that there are seven days of creation and rest. Six days of creation, one day of rest. The first day of creation is the one that we read. There God separated light from darkness. There was evening and morning of first day. Second, God on day two separates the heavens from the waters. There's water and he causes an expanse to occur. And that expanse is the heavens. So you've got heavens separating the waters. Do you know this word, this word is, let me write it down here for you. Do you know the word cosmology? Some of you think, yeah, that's study of beauticians. <laughs> no, that's cosmetology. This is just cosmology. This is not where one of my, my daughters is going to say to me, Dad, man, glad you taught this morning. I was watching on the internet and I remembered I got to get a hair appointment. <laughs> no. Cosmology is ology from the Greek word logos, means study of the cosmos. Our cosmology is how we view things. We view things as a vast universe. And in this universe are galaxies. And one of the galaxies is over here. This is the Milky Way galaxy. Over here is the Snickers gallery. <laughs> there are galaxies all over the place. Kit Kat galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, there is a solar system out here in the wings, and it's our solar system. And it's got a sun, and it's got these planets rotating around it. Some of the planets, like ours, have little moons going around them. And this is the way we understand the universe. And if we want to focus in and hone in on our planet, we understand that we've got Earth, uh, is made up of water mostly, but in addition to water, we've got uh, minerals and, and dirt and rocks and, and inside the crust, we've got magma and, and, and melted mineral masses and, and, and we've got all of these different structures. And it's on a, a globe uh, that's kind of egg-shaped and it's at a little bit of an angle and it spins around on an axis. It goes around the sun. That's our cosmology. The cosmology, if, if the writer of Genesis had been using, if God, when he gave Genesis out, had used our cosmology, those people would not have had a clue what he was talking about. So he spoke with their cosmology. Their cosmology was very different. They thought that the earth was flat. They thought it probably had mountains at the edges that held up this area called the sky. And the sky fit on top of those mountains. And they thought somewhere all down here there's lots of water and the water can bubble up from the ground springs because the water's down here too. And the earth is set and its foundations are set on the waters. And you've got uh, the underworld is down here too. The Greeks would have told you big things about the underworld. 
because it's under the world. And up here they thought there was water too. And there were windows that could move around. There are clouds. Those clouds could open up and the water from there could leak down here. It's called rain. That was their cosmology. And so when the writer says that God caused the heavens to separate the waters... You've got the waters down here under the ground and in the oceans and everywhere. In the springs and the lakes and the rivers. And you've got the water that's somewhere up above the sky. Sky are the heavens. This is the heavens. And so the heavens separate the water from up there and the water from down here. And God did that on day two. If we go back to the Elmo, I mean the PowerPoint. So day two, he causes the heavens to separate. Day three, he gathers the waters together so that the land appears and can sprout vegetation. And that happens on day three. So now you've got land. And this is how the, in their, their cosmology, this is what's being said. Then on day four, God creates the sun for the day the moon and the stars for the night. Then on day five, God creates fish to go swim in the sea and birds to fly in the heavens or sky. And then on day six, he makes animals and bugs and people. It says bugs, creepy things. It's the Hebrew, creepy crawlies. And God makes animals, the cattle, the beasts of the field. He makes all the little creepy crawlies, ladybugs, caterpillars, roaches. <laughs> Becky says, no, those came from the fall. <laughs> People, and he makes them on day six. And then having worked for six days, making all of these things, he's done and he rests on day seven. That's the biblical account in Genesis chapter 1 and then Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 starts with what some people consider to be a second account I think rather it's a focused in account of creation of Adam and Eve these are the generations toledotes the Hebrew phrase and it's used 12 times I think 12 in Genesis but each time it indicates what's coming is a more direct focus of what we've already talked about these are the generations of the heaven and earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant had yet sprung up, which, by the way, if you remember, if we go back, bam, 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 vegetation and land, day three. Man, woman, day six. But this... Further elucidation says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. There was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man. Now, that's a second part of the story that we'll deal with when we get back. Please come back. I believe that the message of the first three chapters of Genesis is the most important message that gives meaning to the cross of Christ more than anything else in the Bible. So it's absolutely important that we understand it for what it says. But the key question for us first is how literal do we want to take that Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3? And we're literal people. I believe in the inerrant Word of God. I don't think that it's pictures and images. I think that it's what we are to understand. But understanding Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, please know that there is a perspective on how to read the Bible inerrantly and understand it from a literal end. At one end of the spectrum, is it's fully literal. I'm going to believe 100% exactly the way it says it in the most common sense way I can the far end of the other extreme is it's allegorical 
And then there are lots of places in the middle. Now, if I were to poll you and I could talk to each of you individually, I would bet that y'all, most of y'all are in the middle. I do not believe anyone in here, and if there is, it's going to be two or three people, believe fully, literally. You might think you do, but you don't, unless you want to say that God speaks Hebrew. Well, I mean, he can. Unless you want to say he spoke Hebrew in the world into existence. Because what the Bible says is, God said, let there be light. But he doesn't say it in English. He says, Vayahi. He says it in Hebrew. So you sit there and say, hmm, well, I hadn't thought of that being literal. I've read a book by a gentleman who's convinced Hebrew is the oldest language, and it's the divine language, because if you're going to read Genesis 1 literally, God spoke Hebrew. Doesn't say God said in a divine tongue. Doesn't say God said in an angelic uh, uh, voice. Doesn't say God thought it. It says God said, and then it puts a Hebrew phrase there. So God said it in Hebrew, if you want to be literal. But if you study languages at all, you see how Hebrew is a derived language from other West Semitic dialects and tongues. And you understand that, 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 that that's just the language that it was being written in. At the allegorical end of the scale, you've got things like the Chronicles of Narnia that give you know, an allegorical idea that we're to understand this in some, this represents that or that represents this. I don't think that that's to be the, the reading either. I'm not at either of those extremes. But I do think that there is an incredibly important meaning to this story that most of us don't, don't get taught. And that's why I'm excited to speak to that. In two, I'm going to keep baiting you all. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. But for today, if we're going to understand it first... We've got to ask a couple of questions that are very fair and legitimate questions. One question is, did God make everything in six 24-hour days? I know Miss Carolyn believes that. <laughs> this is one of the areas where I love her as my Christian sister so much. My second mom, she tells me every Mother's Day I need to get her a gift. But, but on this one, <laughs> but on this one, on this one, she and I have a disagreement. Are the days in order? Day one, two, three, four, five, six. Some people say no. Are there gaps in the days? Is there a gap not even just in the days? Is there in, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Is there a gap between that and the earth was void and without form? Had something happened between that time where there was a fallen, uh, uh, you know, some people believe that's the era where Satan fell and the angels fell. And, and, and is that there? Is that a proper reading of it? Are there gaps in the days? Here's one. Are there other ways to understand the story and still not say it's allegorical? Say it's, 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 it is what it says, but it's got a different meaning. Let's spend some time on this first one. Did God make everything in six 24-hour days? I'm sorry, Miss Carolyn, but my answer to that is no. Okay, now we're, here's the deal. I've got a gentleman in this class who's a dear friend who emails with me, and he told me, he said, you better tell those people, because he doesn't agree with me, that, that most Hebraists do not agree with you on this point. I disagree with him on that. And, and I've, I think most Hebraists do agree with me on this point, but there clearly is a division of opinions out there. But let's get one thing straight. If you want to adhere to that view then get rid of this idea of 24 hours. Because the earth spins on its axis in 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.0916 seconds. And it's slowing down. So a day today is not what a day used to be. Just like a dollar isn't what it used to be. It's slowing down. <laughs> it's like, I'm not what I used to be. I'm slowing down. The earth is slowing down in its rotation. And it's not constant. You can look up how long is today going to be. And today's actually on the short end. 
Usually there are longer days. I'm not talking about how much sunlight. I'm talking about how long it takes to make one complete rotation on the axis. So be careful when you say, well, a day means 24 hours. That's, that's the same trap that people fell into where for centuries they thought if you were really holy, you died on your birthday. Because it always said, you know, uh, you know, Methuselah died when he was 1,134 years old. Doesn't say any days. Doesn't say any months. He must have died on his birthday. <laughs> they thought that for years. Okay, somebody said something really, oh, Dale Hearn's dying on his birthday. That's good, Dale. That's clever. Really holy man. Uh-huh. Making fun of the Lord. Anyway, the... Um, <laughs> Oh, now you're making fun of me. Um, there's a difference between a sidereal day, which is how long it takes to rotate around the, the, the axis, and how long we visibly see the sun, and it takes for the sun to get back to the same point at four minutes. But periodically, they have to add even a leap second to clocks. By the way, if you want to know where our 24-hour day, the time is based on, how long it took for the earth to spin in 1820. But this idea that God made everything with one rotation of the earth, I'm sorry. Same position of the sun, by the way, for June 9th, 2019, it's going to take 24 hours and four ten thousandths of a second to do it today. That's a solar day. And then I did tell you over time, this rotation is slowing. Now, what do we do with that? How do we handle these things? What does it mean? If a day is not 24 hours, does it mean that, why? well, God made it in 24, 3 hours, 57, minutes, 9 minutes, and 4 seconds, and da, da, da. no? Okay, let's go back to the text, and let's try and work a little bit more out of the Hebrew text for just a moment. There's a Hebrew word that's translated day. It is the word yom. Yom. Just say yom with me. Yom. We would spell it Y-O-M. Yom. And if you were to look yom up in a Hebrew dictionary, you would see that it's got a number of different meanings. It means day. It means daylight. It can be a special day or a holy day or a holiday. It can mean an era, an age. It can mean any specific point of time in a day. It can just mean a general collection of time. Remember, we've got a vocabulary, a working vocabulary, the average human being in America, of 50,000 words. 8,000 Hebrew words have to make up for our 50,000. So they're pulling weight. This word yom is used over 2,200 times in the Old Testament. It's used in all sorts of different places. In Amos 9, it's used, In that day, yom, God says, I'll raise up the booth of David that's fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden. Here's something God's going to raise up God's going to rebuild, God's going to make in a day. But he's talking about bringing Israel back from captivity, bringing Judah back, excuse me, from captivity. Or he may be talking about the Messiah and the church. But he's not talking about a 24-hour time period. Jerusalem was not built in 24 hours, even by the Lord. It's the same word means day, daylight, special day, era, age. Let me give you another passage. Look at this passage a little closer to home. Genesis 1, 5. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning, the first day. That word yom is used twice there. 
the translators capitalize it the first time. It's not capitalized in Hebrew. They didn't do that. They're just trying to let you know it's a different meaning of the word that yom. Because there, the first time it's used in that Genesis passage, it clearly means daylight type thing. Though not by the sun, because the sun's not made for another three days. It's day four. So the first time, it clearly doesn't mean 24 hours. The first time day is used in the creation account, it doesn't mean 24 hours. The God called the light day and the darkness night because there was evening and morning the first day. See, if you look at it, this is day one. Light separated from darkness. He doesn't make the sun, moon, and stars till day four. So that first day is not... So what did I tell you last week? If Scripture and science seems to differ, you keep digging. If Scripture and Scripture seems to differ, keep digging. Because it just means you hadn't figured it out yet. You hadn't gotten to the root yet. See, you can dig through this and you can figure this out real easy. There are some options on how you read Genesis chapter 1. And one option is you can read six 24-hour days, though I would urge you to consider that it's not 24 hours, it's 23, 56 point. Oh, not depending on the day. And the tidal pull of the moon actually is having an effect on that. But the real way that I want you to consider reading it is to go back to it where he, God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was just mush. It was without form. There was no substance. It was void. Tohu vabohu. That's what the, the, the Hebrew is saying here. It's without form, and, it's, and that is the verse, that's the thesis sentence for the story in Genesis 1. That's the verse that unlocks it. That's the verse that tells you how to understand it. That's the verse where you understand that the earth was without form and void, and what God did is God decided how to form the earth and how to fill the the forms. And that's the way it's set up. And so when we read the story this way, we understand first thing God does is he makes forms. He forms things. So he forms light and darkness and gives them meaning. He forms the heavens to the sky to separate the waters. Again, that's their cosmology. We know better. We now know that the clouds aren't windows opening up waters from above the sky, the heavens, to dump down. We know that it's condensation and rain. We understand that. But in their cosmology, it's talking about the sky being made to separate the waters. Day three is the land. And the land, oops, go back. They, ah, those should not come at the same time. Land is day three. Now, the filling. The filling is where God goes back in the story and he says, now I spent three days forming. By the way, three is a very divine and holy number. So he, it, it divinely forms. I'm giving you a little insight into how I understand this story. He divinely forms and now he's going to divinely fill. He'll spend three days filling the forms he made. So on day four, he fills the form of light and darkness with the sun for the day and the moon and the stars for the night. This is not him writing a science text for you to figure out the order in which he made these things. This is him instructing the Israelites that they needed to understand that the God who formed this world is also the God who filled this world. Because they're ultimately going to understand that the God who formed them wants to fill them. And the God who formed his church wants to fill his church. And the God who formed the nation of Israel wants to fill the nation of Israel. And the God who formed his temple wants to fill his temple. This is the message we have a forming and a filling God. And so he forms light and darkness and he fills it. He forms the heavens and the waters. And then what's he do on the next day? He fills them. He puts fish in the sea. 
He puts birds in the heaven. The third day of filling, day six, he fills what he did the third day of forming. He fills the land. And so on day six, he makes the animals and the bugs and the people. Whoops. And that's what he does. By the way, day seven, he rests. He doesn't take a 24-hour rest. That's insight into the story as well. Because the psalmist and the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 4 both say we're still in the day of God's rest. That day, the seventh day, has not ended in terms of the creation story. We're still in that day. We're not in the 24-hour period or 23 hours, 56 minutes, however many seconds. We're not in that. By the way, there was evening and there was morning, the end of a day, sort of inherently tells you that the writer's not expecting you to think three days before the sun gets formed that there's evening and morning, that these are to be taken that way. So God rests, but the reason God rests is because he's formed and filled the earth. He's done it. He's through. He doesn't rest because he's tired. He's not, whew, man, worn out. I mean, it's no big deal making the planets. That was fine. Sun was pretty easy. You know, I did okay with the water. That was H2O. That was not that big a deal. Um, plants, that was tough, but I, I got through it. A lot of variety there, though. A lot to be done. You know, what was really just tore me up was making woman. <laughs> Man, after that, I got to take a nap. <laughs> Never have I made anything so complicated, so marvelously beautiful and charming. The answer to all of life's desires. I need a nap. No, God was not tired. God was through. He had completed his creation. Now, when we try to read this story, we've got to read it within the cosmology that it's written. And that's what I've tried to do with you this morning. But even just as important, we've got to read it in the culture. Because this was very different than all of Israel's neighbors understood the world to be. Very different God than they understood. Very different humanity. Very different earth. Very different purposes. And we've got to understand that to be fair with this. Because that's what's going to infuse it with meaning for us. Now, I'm telling you that this story was written deliberately and carefully. And it conveys exactly the information God wants. This is, this is perfectly written for us. Do not think that I'm saying anything less. This is perfectly written for us. But within the framework of understanding the integrity of Scripture, the need for God is even more. The need for God is not simply to say, okay, boom, poof, that exists now. The need for God to form and to fill is for God to give intelligent reasoning and intelligent thought and, and intelligent and, and, and infuse life with purpose. And so I'm dying to tell you how this story is best understood. But to do that, I've got to rely upon some books from King Asher Bernapal, Ber, Asher Bernapal. I don't know how other people say his name. I'll tell you how we say it in Lubbock. In Lubbock, we would say King Ashurbanipal. But that may not be the way he said it. If I ever see him walking down the streets of the afterlife, I'll call him out and see if he turns. Hey, Ashurbanipal! See if he turns around. I'm not sure he will. But he was a king, a, a, an Assyrian king, who had an incredible library in Nineveh that was uncovered by archaeologists and explorers in the mid-1800s. 
And so from those recoveries, we've got tablets that explain how Israel's neighbors viewed the creation of the world. And they help us understand the message of Genesis even better. And so I'm excited to do that with you. But for now, I need to get to our take-home action now steps. I want to sing the wonders of God. In the beginning, God. Whether you're reading it the way Miss Carolyn reads it, or whether you read it the way I read it, or whether you read it the way anybody else may read it, you can't run from those words, in the beginning, God, right? God is in the beginning. Heaven help us if we get so wrapped up looking at this world through our science lens that we fail to see what's behind it. Heaven forbid we, if we get so focused in on trying to understand our theology of, 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 of God that we fail to take into account that he made this world and he's put this world's order together for us to also get insight into him. Paul says it's the, the, the world reflects his invisible qualities and character and nature. John Calvin said, we read the book of nature and we read the book of, of Revelation together. And don't go to the extremes. In the beginning, God. I want to tell you how wonderful he is and what he's done. And the second take-home point for me is, I want to hear and I want to see God. Over and over and over. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. When you get to the prophets, there's a phrase that Isaiah and other prophets use. It's, Ki pi Adonai diver, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Because God is communicating. God's not only communicating this world into existence in the Genesis 1 story, but God is communicating to us. And he speaks to us. If you don't hear God, then a couple of things have gone wrong. Either you are so upset and angry at whatever it may be, there's a host of things to get us angry, that you've just decided, I'm not listening. Or you've just gotten so distant that you've shut it off and become numb to the voice. It's like white noise. You just don't notice that the fan is blowing unless you stop and I hear it. Or you just don't recognize it. You don't recognize that something's in you saying there's got to be purpose to life. There's got to be more to life. There maybe is something called beauty. There maybe is something called meaning. There maybe is something noble. Maybe there is something true. Maybe there is something of value and merit and right. So I want to hear and see God. God said, I want to hear him. And then finally, before I leave, I want to thank God. I want to know that the God who made things made things good. And he made things to bless us so that we can bless others. And so we can make decisions today, whether it's our birthday or not that I'm going to use the tools that I've got to try to make this world a better place, to try and take something that evil's doing and turn it into good, to love the unlovable, to serve those in need, to, to help those who are struggling, to do right even if nobody watches. These are things we can do to make the world a better place. And when we do that, we're doing the will of God. Just as surely as Sherry is when she treats that kid for strep throat. If you don't like what I had to say this morning, um, form a club with Miss Carolyn and <laughs> she'll give you my email address and you can email me. But otherwise... You, you, th this is so important to us and I really want to get into to, to what the message is. And I'm sorry I won't be here next week. There's just no way around that for me. 
So God bless you guys. Let me say a prayer of blessing over you and I'll see you in two weeks. Father, thank you so much that you give us meaning in this life. Thank you for speaking into our lives. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us uh, an opportunity to gather insight in your word. Thank you for, for growing us up in your word. Thank you for handling it when we have doubts. Thank you for handling our fears. Thank you for handling our hesitations. Thank you for handling our questions. Thank you for handling our challenges. Thank you for loving us in such a tender, fatherly way. We bless you as your children and sing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen.